Hey everyone, it's Dr. Marcon, and this is part two of chapter 19 on the heart. We're going to start off with the conducting system of the heart. So cardiac muscle tissue has an intrinsic ability to generate and conduct electrical impulses uh, that stimulate these same cells within that tissue to contract rhythmically. Now what intrinsic means is that it is done within that its own tissue. It, it does it on its own. So um, cardiac muscle cells will generate and conduct impulses um, and then they will signal uh, cells to contract rhythmically within uh, the heart tissue. So intrinsic to the heart muscle itself does not depend on extrinsic or outside nerve impulses. So the conducting system is basically a series of specialized cardiac cells that will carry the impulses throughout the heart, uh, signaling the muscles to contract in a proper sequence. It also initiates each contraction sequence, which basically sets the basic heart rate. So we have a specialized group of cells known as the sinoatrial node, and it is this um, node that will set the inherent rate of contraction or the heart rate. So the electrical impulse that causes contraction of the heart muscle begins at the sinoatrial node. Now the sinoatrial node or the SA node is a crescent shaped mass of cells that will lie in the wall of the right atrium inferior to the superior vena cava. Again, the SA node sets the basic heart rate by generating about 70 to 80 electrical impulses per minute. That's why it's known as the heart's pacemaker or the pacemaker uh, node or pacemaker cells. Impulses will then spread in a wave along the cardiac muscles um, or cardiac muscle fibers of the atria, which will signal the atria to contract. Uh, and then most of these impulses will travel along uh, the atria to the, uh, or along the internodal pathway to the atrioventricular node, or the AV node. Um, the AV node is in the inferior part of the interatrial septum. Now at the AV node, the impulse will be be delayed for about a second. Think of it as all these cars kind of descending upon a toll. So they have to pay the toll, um, they get paused for a second, and then they move on. So at the AV node, the impulse is delayed, and then finally after this delay, the impulses will race through to the AV bundle, also known as the bundle of Hiss, which is which enters the interventricular septum and divides into right and left bundle branches. So from the AV bundle or bundle of Hiss to the bundle branches. Now halfway down the interventricular septum, the bundle branches will terminate in the Purkinje fibers, also known as the subendocardial conducting network, uh, which will approach the apex of the heart, which is located in the left fifth intercostal space, mid clavicular line. So these fibers will approach the apex of the heart and then turn superiorly um, into the ventricular walls. Now, why does it do, do that? This arrangement will ensure that contraction of the ventricles will begin at the apex of the heart and travel superiorly so that as the um, ventricles contract from the apex going superiorly, ventricular blood will be ejected superiorly into the great arteries, namely the pulmonary trunk on the right and the aorta on the left. Okay, and we can kind of see this sequence in the next slide. So here, first, we have the impulse being generated at the SA node or the pacemaker, and this impulse travels in a wave throughout the atria. Uh, most of this impulse will then get to the AV node. Um, from the AV node, the impulse will pause about 0.1 seconds at the AV node, and from the AV node, the impulse will then travel down uh, the atrio ventricular bundle or the bundle of Hiss, which connects uh, the atria to the ventricles. And then the bundle branches, af the, um, I'm sorry, the bundle of Hiss will bifurcate into the right and left uh, bundle branches. So the right bundle branch here, left bundle branch there. 
which will conduct the impulses through the interventricular septum, again, that wall between the right and left ventricles. And then from the interventricular septum, um, the, uh, the bundle branches will then uh, become the Purkinje fibers or the subendocardial conducting network, which will approach the apex of the heart. Um, and then uh, run superiorly along the walls of the ventricles. Um, so the subendocardial conducting network will stimulate the contractile cells of both ventricles, allowing for that contraction to occur starting at the apex and then moving superiorly so that any blood in the ventricles will be moved towards either the pulmonary trunk on the right or on the to, towards the aorta on the left. Now, we talked about the fibrous cardiac skeleton um, that is between the atria and the ventricles. This cardiac skeleton is what the, um, the valves attach to. Now, the fibrous cardiac skeleton is actually non-conducting, so it, pre it prevents impulses in the atrial wall from proceeding directly to the ventricular wall. Um, as a result, only the signals that will go through the AV node will be able to continue on. So think of it as that toll here that delays the impulse by 0.1 seconds. So only the impulses that are traveling along the AV node will be allowed to continue down into uh, the into the ventricle. So that AV bundle or that bundle of his is the only connection um, that allows the impulse to travel from the atria to the ventricles. Um, in the next slide, we'll actually see uh, the sequence of um, events that occur during ventricular contraction in an EKG. Now, um, when we talk about words such as depolarization and repolarization, depolarization is actually what occurs when you have contraction of uh, the chambers. So, and then repolarization, think of relaxation of the chambers. So first, we will have depolarization occurring in the atria. So that electrical impulse is uh, generated in the SA node causing atrial depolarization or atrial contraction, which will push blood into the ventricles. So the atrial depolarization, depolarization initiated by the SA node is represented by the P wave. So we have different waves within the EKG. The first wave is the P wave, which represents atrial contraction or atrial depolarization. So then um, once atrial depolarization is, in, is complete, we have that slight delay at that AV node, kind of, you know, the impulse going towards a toll, and it's delayed by 0.1 second. And we see uh, this um, line between the P wave um, and before the beginning of the QRS complex. That represents that delay um, at the AV node. Now, once the impulse is allowed to carry on into the ventricles, we have ventricular depolarization or ventricular contraction. So ventricular uh, depolarization begins at the apex here. Um, this is causes that QRS complex. So the first downward deflection is Q. We then have uh, the peak of R, and then the next def uh, downward deflection is S. So the QRS complex representing ventricular depolarization or ventricular contraction. Now, while this is occurring, um, we have repolarization of the atria. What does that mean? We have relaxation of the atria to fill with blood so that it can push more blood into the ventricles. So right now the QRS complex is representing ventricular depolarization or ventricular contraction, meaning the blood is being pushed towards the great vessels, either the pulmonary trunk on the right or the aorta on the left. And while that is occurring, we have a repolarization of the atria so that they can fill with blood. So at the end of the QRS complex, we have um, completion of ventricular depolarization, uh, which uh, represents that ST segment or that line be between uh, the S of the QRS complex um, right before the T wave. Um, 
And then we will have uh, the beginning of ventricular repolarization or relaxation, uh, which begins at the apex, and this is represented by the T wave here. Um, and then once we have completion um, of ventricular repolarization, we have that line after the T wave, and then begins again another, uh, another sequence. Okay, starting off with atrial depolarization. So that is sort of the interpretation of the things that you will see on an EKG. EKG stands for electrocardiogram. Um, it al also is called an ECG. So ECG and EKGs are basically the same thing. It just depends on the spelling. EKG um, with a K is just the German spelling of electrocardiogram because in German they, they spell cardio with a K. Um, in the regular English spelling, uh, cardiogram is spelled with a C. So if you hear the words EKG or ECG, they're the same thing. It's just different spelling. So that is the sequence of events um, of depolarization and repolarization of the chambers within the heart that allows for blood to move through the heart. With regards to innervation, again, the heart rate is set by the SA node, so it's an intrinsic system. Um, rate is altered by extrinsic or outside um, factors and neural controls. So we have visceral sensory fibers as well as parasympathetic fibers. Uh, and these nerves will pass through the cardiac plexus. The first fibers we'll talk about are the parasympathetic fibers. The parasympathetic fibers are branches of the vagus nerve, uh, which is one of the cranial nerves. So parasympathetic fibers, think of um, the rest and digest function um, that allows the body to kind of uh, rest and, and relax. Um, most of the time it will increase digestive system function but decrease everything else. So parasympathetic fibers, in order to allow the body to rest, it will decrease heart rate. Um, the parasympathetic fibers innervation is restricted only to the SA node, the AV node, as well as the coronary arteries. Now sympathetic nerves, sympathetic nervous system, think of the fight or flight response. We see a big dinosaur coming our way, hopefully not like Jurassic Park. Uh, we want to run away. So the sympathet sympathetic nervous system prepares our body to fight or flight. Um, now sympathetic nerves will travel to the heart from the cervical and upper thoracic chain ganglia and will innervate the SA node, the AV node, and the coronary arteries just like the parasympathetic nerves. Um, they will also innervate uh, cardiac musculature throughout the heart. Sympathetic nerve uh, innervation will increase heart rate as well as strength of contraction because we want more blood pumping if we want to run away or if we want to, you know, fight um, an incoming dinosaur or, or any sort of um, monster or whatever. So that's why we want to increase heart rate as well as the strength of contraction to pump more blood to the rest of our body. So all this autonomic input are controlled by cardiac centers uh, within the medulla, specifically the reticular formation of the medulla. Um, the cardioinhibitory center will influence parasympathetic neurons, again, the uh, rest and digest mode to decrease heart rate. And then the cardioacceleratory center uh, influences sympathetic neurons, the um, sympathetic uh, nervous system that will uh, put us in the fight or flight mode. So here we can see um, our innervation, our autonomic innervation of the heart. We have the vagus nerve, um, which uh, creates some parasympathetic innervation to decrease heart rate. Um, and again, these will innervate the SA node, the AV node, as well as the coronary arteries. And then we have uh, the sympathetic cardiac nerve, which will increase heart rate as well as force of contraction also innervating um, the same structure as the SA node, the AV node, as well as the coronary arteries. So our blood supply to the heart. 
In lab, we talked about the coronary arteries. We know that the coronary arteries are direct branches of the ascending aorta, so that first part of the uh, aorta. So um, the coronary arteries are the blood supply to the muscular walls and tissues of the heart. We have two main branches. We have the right coronary artery um, as well as the left coronary artery, and both of these arteries uh, sit in that depression or groove between the atria and the ventricles called the coronary sulcus. So coronary arteries will arise from the ascending aorta or the base of the aorta and run in that depression or groove, the coronary sulcus. The left coronary artery uh, will then branch into um, a, an artery that will travel anteriorly um, and into that interventricular sulcus. So it branches into the anterior interventricular artery um, as well as the circumflex artery. Now the anterior interventricular artery is also known as the LAD or the left anterior descending artery. This is the clinical name that we use for the anterior interventricular artery. And this is the artery that um, is most likely to become occluded and cause a myocardial infarction or the death of muscle tissue with its um, occlusion. So MI also known uh, clinically as a heart attack. The right coronary artery also will descend into that groove of the coronary sulcus and will branch to form the marginal artery, giving blood supply to the right margin of the heart. Um, the right coronary artery will later branch into the posterior interventricular artery. Now, clinically, this is known as the PDA or posterior descending artery, not public displays of infection. So right coronary artery going traveling posteriorly and into that sulcus between the right and left ventricle, forming that posterior descending artery. Now the cardiac veins will carry deoxygenated blood from the heart wall uh, to the right atrium. Uh, we know that the cardiac veins also occupy those sulci on the heart's surface. The main cardiac vein that you see posteriorly is the coronary sinus. The coronary sinus runs in the posterior part of the coronary sulcus and will return the majority of venous blood from the heart to the right atrium. It's one of those vessels that we talked about, one of the three vessels that will drain deoxygenated blood into the right atrium. The two other vessels we talked about were the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. And we have three veins that will drain into the coronary sinus, so three tributaries of the coronary sinus. There's the great cardiac vein, uh, the middle cardiac vein, as well as the small cardiac vein. So here we can see the coronary circulation. We see the branches of the right and left coronary artery. We have a marginal artery here running along the margin of the right ventricle. We can see the right coronary artery traveling posteriorly to eventually form that posterior interventricular artery or PDA, uh, posterior descending artery. We have the left coronary artery which will branch into the LAD or the left anterior descending artery and that circumflex artery, which will also travel posteriorly, uh, giving blood supply to the posterior portions of the heart. With regards to our major cardiac veins, posterior, posteriorly we see the coronary sinus, um, and then we have the different veins that also uh, form tributaries into the coronary sinus. We have the small cardiac vein, uh, we have the middle uh, cardiac vein, uh, posteriorly, and then we have this great cardiac vein that will also drain into the coronary sinus. Now disorders of the heart. Um, a major disorder of the heart that uh, we often talk about is coronary artery disease, and we have um, many diseases that fall under the category of coronary artery disease. The first one is atherosclerosis. Um, atherosclerosis is when we find fatty deposits within uh, the arteries that will cause occlusion of the artery and cause that lumen to become smaller. This will cause an increase in blood pressure because the heart has to work harder in order to push the blood through these um, occluded arteries due to the fatty deposits. 
Another disorder of the heart, we have angina pectoris. Angina pectoris is chest pain, and usually angina pectoris is associated with uh, a myocardial infarction or a heart attack. And a myocardial infarction, again, is caused by a blocked coronary artery, which causes ischemia and um, possibly death of myocardial or heart tissue. Now, um, sometimes patients will present with silent ischemia, meaning there is no pain or warning. There is no angina pectoris um, that can kind of signal an oncoming heart attack. It just, it just can occur uh, without any warning. And usually silent ischemia is more, um, more likely in diabetic patients as well as women. Another disorder of the heart that we often talk about is heart failure. Heart failure is due to a progressive weakening of the heart and the heart walls uh, due to heart disease. And usually um, the heart cannot meet the body's demands for oxygenated blood. And then we have congestive heart failure. This is when we have an enlargement of the heart because it's trying to um, work harder to pump blood to the rest of the body. And eventually the heart will enlarge, causing what's known as hypertrophy. Um, and then the efficiency of the pumping mechanism of the heart will then decline and can cause death. Another disorder is pulmonary arterial hypertension. Uh, this is when we have enlargement and potential failure of the right ventricle due to some sort of um, congestion within the lungs. So the right ventricle has to work harder to push blood into the lungs, but due to some uh, disorder, some congestion in the lungs, um, we have um, the right ventricle working harder. Eventually it will also enlarge and hypertrophy and then cause um, a decrease in efficiency of the pumping mechanism and potential failure of the right ventricle. Arrhythmias. Arrhythmias are disorders of the conduction system of the heart and the arrhythmias are a variation away from normal heart rhythm. So arrhythmias are abnormal heart rhythms and we have different kinds. Um, first kind we'll talk about is ventricular fibrillation. This is when you have rapid random firing of electrical impulses in the ventricles, uh, results from a crippled conductive conducting system, and is the most common cause of cardiac arrest. We saw earlier how the conduction system follows a sequence of events. If it somehow deviates from the sequence, um, it can cause a lot of havoc and ventricular fibrillation is when the uh, sequence of events or electrical impulses occurring in the ventricles is no longer sequential but random and again causing cardiac arrest. Atrial fibrillation, um, this is when impulses will circle within the atrial myocardium uh, stimulating the AV node. Atrial fibrillation actually promotes the formation of clots, and that is bad because these clots will then uh, flow or, or travel to uh, blood vessels, and these blood vessels will become occluded by these clots and lead to strokes, and it can occur um, within the brain. We have a cerebrovascular accident or a stroke, uh, or it can occur anywhere in the body. Um, so. Atrial fibrillation will occur in episodes and is often characterized by anxiety, fatigue, shortness of breath, and palpitations. My mom was actually diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, and not only did she have to take medication uh, to kind of prevent this from happening, but she also at one point had to take blood thinners because, again, atrial fibrillation can cause clots, which could eventually uh, occlude blood vessels. With regards to the development of the heart, um, in fetal life, the heart will fold into the, uh, thorac the thoracic region about uh, day 20 to 21, and will start pumping about day 22, so about three weeks. Uh, the earliest heart chambers are unpaired, and then um, from Basically, from tail to head, the chambers include the sinus venosus, the atrium, the ventricle, and the bulbous cordis. Now, the sinus venosus will become uh, the smooth-walled part of the right atrium. 
coronary sinus and the SA node and can also contribute to the back wall of the left atrium. The atrium will become the ridged parts of the right and left atria. The ventricle is the strongest pumping chamber um, and will give rise to the left ventricle, whereas the bulbous cordis uh, and the truncus arteriosus will give rise to the pulmonary trunk and the first part of the aorta. Um, bulbous cordis also gives rise to um, the left ventricle along with the ventricle. So here we see the heart development sequence of events starting at day 20. We can see that endothelial tubes will begin to fuse. Um, by day 22, the heart starts pumping. Um, and day 24, the heart continues to elongate and then kind of starts to bend. And this bending continues at day 28 as the ventricle will move caudally or towards the tail and the atrium will move cranially or towards the head. And by day 35, bending is complete and we can see uh, the basic structures of the heart. Now congenital heart defects can be traced to about month two of development. And the most common defect is a ventricular septal defect. So a defect within the, uh, the wall, the interventricular wall, that wall that separates the right and left ventricles. We have two basic categories of defects. So first we have inadequately oxygenated blood reaching the body tissues uh, because the blood is allowed to mix. And then the ventricles will labor under an increased workload because it's trying to work harder to pump um, oxygen-rich blood to the rest of the body. So here we see some different congenital heart defects. First one is a ventricular septal defect, usually a hole in the interventricular septum. Uh, so in this um, type of defect, the superior part of the interventricular septum will fail to form. So we have mixing of blood between the two ventricles. Uh, more blood is shifted from the left to the right because the left, I'm sorry, from the left to right, because the left uh, ventricle is stronger. And this occurs in about one in every uh, 500 births. Transposition of the great vessels, basically this is a... Uh, um, a switching sides of the great vessels. So the aorta will come from the right ventricle, whereas the pulmonary trunk will come from the left. Uh, this results when the bulbous cordis does not divide properly. So we'll have unoxygenated blood passing repeatedly around the systemic circuit, while oxygenated blood will recycle around the pulmonary circuit. Um, and this occurs in about one in every 1,000 births. Coarctation of the aorta. This is a narrowing of a part of the aorta. Um, if we have a narrowing, this will actually increase uh, the workload of the left ventricle because it has to work harder to pump blood to the rest of the body and will cause hypertrophy or enlargement of the left ventricle. This occurs in about one in every 1,500 births. Now, tetralogy of Fallot. Tetra means four, meaning there are four conditions that have to be present in order for this uh, congenital heart defect to be present. So the first one is a, a pulmonary stenosis. Um, so pulmonary trunk is too narrow and the pulmonary valve is stenosed, which will then re uh, result in a hypertrophy of the right ventricle, so an enlargement of the right ventricle. Also, there has to be some sort of ventricular septal defect, so a hole in the interventricular septum. And finally, uh, the aorta will open from both ventricles. So those four events uh, are present in Tetralogy of Fallot, and this occurs in about one in every 2,000 births. Now, in old age, the heart usually functions well throughout life. Regular exercise will increase the strength of the heart. And we know that aerobic exercise can help clear fatty deposits in coronary arteries. So again, watch your diet. Watch your triglycerides or the fats in your diet. So, you know, if you have a family history of heart disease, watch your cholesterol, watch your triglycerides, watch your lipids, your HDLs and your LDLs. So HDLs are your happy lipids, LDLs are your lousy lipids. So, you know, these are things that you can get tested um, uh, doing, you know, labs.
Other age-related changes that um, can occur include the hardening and thickening of heart valve cusps, um, which could cause a defect in the closing of these cusps and cause a regurgitation and heart murmurs. Also, there's a decline in cardiac reserve, um, which will decrease the amount of blood that is reaching the rest of the body. And then we have fibrosis of cardiac muscle, which will decrease uh, muscle activity or cardiac muscle activity. So that is the end of chapter 19 on the heart.